What is going on, party people? Welcome to the next episode. Today, what we're going to talk about is why your work may be like a musty old towel. Let's do it. What is going on, people? Welcome back to another episode of the Art Lessons Podcast. I'm your host, Dave Connery, and in this show, we, or rather I, like to express real-time ideas on how to live a creative life, how to build a creative business, how to do creative work, and feel great about it. And I, It's like I, I have this catchphrase, <laughs> and I just keep expanding on it for in, in, into infinitum, and at some point... The podcast episode is going to be 20 minutes of me just explaining what the podcast is about. I promise that's not actually going to happen, but it could. Before we get into everything, I want to give a big, huge shout out to all the new listeners. I saw that I recently had a decent uptick in listens over the last week or so, and so I want to say, hey, thanks, welcome, thanks for coming in and hanging out. I appreciate your eardrums. If you haven't done so and you would be so inclined, I would ask you a favor and go over to iTunes and rate and review the show if you're not on iTunes. You can I don't, do it somewhere else, Spotify, SoundCloud, somewhere. Give it a thumbs up, but primarily iTunes because that's where most of these downloads happen. So if you get a chance, go over to iTunes, rate, review the show. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And then, of course, share this with your friends because who knows, maybe you have a creative friend who needs a little bit of a boost that we can help them with. It's a thought. That's the whole idea, and yeah, so share it. Like I said, if you don't use iTunes, I'm also available on uh, Spotify. I'm also available on SoundCloud. I'm also available on Stitcher and other pl iTunes radio. Amazon Prime, I think somewhere in there. I don't know. You can find me in a lot of different places. Search for me, and you'll find my show. Now, of course, I wouldn't go without sharing some love for all my longtime listeners. You guys are the rocks, and I appreciate your loyalty. I appreciate your listenership, and so thank you. Huge thank you. Big love to you guys, too. And of course, if you haven't rated and reviewed the show, please do that. Today, what I want to talk to you guys about is folding laundry. <laughs> I know that sounds really... Uh, that sounds very uncreative. It mostly is, except for the fact that when you are doing mindless activities like folding clothes, your brain kind of goes into subconscious mode, and that's where things start to really start to click and bang in the back there. The synapses really start popping big time. I was folding laundry, and I was just kind of randomly thinking about different things, and I was folding a couple of these old towels, towels we use for, you know, rags or whatever, washing cars, things like that. I noticed that one of the things about the towel is that when they get really old like that, aside from getting a little tattered and whatnot, the, the ends tend to have shrunk compared to the middle. More likely, the middle has actually expanded compared to the ends, because usually the ends have that really strong stitching along the top and some sort of ribbing in the middle for decoration or whatever, whereas the middle, it only has the stitching on the outside, and so it has more freedom to expand. So when you're folding these things, you can't get them perfectly folded up because the tips don't match the middle, and it just, you just... It just doesn't work that way. It got me thinking about like, hey, you know, that's like art. So yeah, that's like a super ambiguous and seemingly disconnected thought, I'm sure, compared to my laundry, my raggedy old towel laundry, to the artwork that I do. But allow me to explain. And I'll get to it. I'm going to take a road around this, but I'll get back to it, I promise. So for those of you that are watching on the YouTubes, you will see that I have a canvas behind me. And this canvas behind me is older. In fact, I believe, let me look. Let me clarify, 2008. In 2008, I painted this completely bleh abstract. And for those who can't see it, basically, I took two really narrow panels and I put them together to make one big, I would say, I don't know, what is that? Like bigger than 24 by 36, something like. Anyway, so I, it's abstract and it's got like drippings of red and blue along with like kind of tans and browns in the middle. If you look at it, in my perspective, when I did it, it has a very flag kind of reference to it, sort of. At the time, it was a very tumultuous year. 2008 was the end of the Bush era, coming into a very strong political season between all the Democrats that were trying to vie for the new position, and even the Republicans and all that. And so it was a very tumultuous year. So 2008, I'm doing this, I'm thinking, like, God, man, the politics, the, pol the political season, specifically the presidential political season is some of the worst years that I can remember in history. 2016, not uh, excluded. 2012 was eh, not so bad, but at least we had a guy. At least I had a guy in the house that I believed in. But 2008 was like, you couldn't 
it was just ugly and it was it wasn't great. And so I called this burned by the flag because I felt like the political system was failing us because we were more talking about like he said, she said, and what that person didn't do, what this person didn't do versus what we should actually be doing for the country, for ourselves. Anyway, all politics aside, what matters is that at the time, I kind of dug this, but in the process of doing this, I didn't like it. Like in the middle of the process, it was like, oh God, I'm not really liking it. But somewhere along the line, it clicked. And this happens with all of my art. I hate every single art piece that I ever create at some point in the process. Not usually the beginning because I'm kind of like, well, I don't know what I'm doing, so let's just throw some paint at it. Usually in the middle because I'm just like, I have absolutely no idea where this is going. But then at some point, something clicks with it, and it just feels like, okay, now I got it. Now I feel it. Now I'm really starting to feel like it. I'm going somewhere with it. And then I get to a finish, and either I like it a lot, or I like it a little. I finished a piece just recently called Petals Worth Pulling, and you can see that on the website if you want to go check it out. I'll put a link in the description. I, I like that piece, but it's not like my ultimately super great favorite. This one I really liked, and it kind of felt the same back in the day, but now I don't like it anymore because it doesn't represent anything about what I'm doing now. This was my early, early, early stage, my early step back into doing art. And looking back, I was like, yeah, amateurish at best and not great. And, and I could do so much better. When I was doing another one of these mindless activities where you're just letting the, the, you know, the conscious brain click off and start moving into subconscious thinking in the shower, when a lot of this stuff happens, I was in the shower and I had this thought, again, politically about the Constitution, and one of the phrases from the Constitution just popped into my head, and I decided, I want to do that, something. And But then, it like, this picture popped in, this painting popped into my head as well, and I'm like, okay, I can do what I'm doing now, and take this old piece that I'm not feeling too great about, don't want to hang up anymore, and I can fix it. And it still fits the theme, it still works together, but I can improve it and make it better. I could completely fail at that. It's a tad bit scary, but really, when you come, when you look at it, it's just a canvas, and if I mess it up, oh well. Because the way I look at this is that every new piece I do is an experimentation. I've never been one to constantly do the same thing over and over and over and over again. Yes, I've done periods of pieces or I've done series of pieces, but over time, it's like I, I'm not doing anything similar to that. If you've seen any of my collage work, I'm not doing any of the collage work like I was before anymore. If you've seen any of these other old abstracts, I'm not doing any of these old abstract styles anymore. It's something that I do get out of my system and then keep moving on. I keep experimenting. And a lot of times I fail. A lot of times they're not great. A lot of times they end up being something that I'm going to put in the, sh on the, in the closet. And who knows, maybe they'll come back up onto my easel someday in the, in the future and turn into something else. Even when I do that, that might not be, still be that great, but I'm still going to keep pushing. I'm still going to keep experimenting because I feel like the only way I'm going to progressively get better as an artist is to keep testing my own skill level, to keep testing my limits, to keep pushing into new areas that are less comfortable. Just the other day when I was painting that petals worth pulling piece, I put a skull in there because that's what I do. I've said it here on the video before that I do skulls and birds and things. And yes, those are kind of constant motifs for me, but I put that skull in there and it felt completely arbitrary. And partway through the videos I was recording that, which you'll see later this week, I wrote this little note. Let me hold, I'm gonna hold this up for the people watching the video. Fuck my arbitrary bullshit. I wrote that because as soon as I saw that skull and looked at it from a distance, I was like, nope, that sucks. And I painted right over it. And as I'm pondering all this stuff, it got me thinking about a, a bunch of people that I see on Instagram who I would classify as creatively conservative. What I mean by that is that they find a thing that they're good at and that they do really well at, and then they just milk that for everything it's worth. They just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again because it hit, it's a big success, and so they keep doing that thing and they don't expand, they don't grow because they see like, oh, well, people resonate with that, so I should keep doing that. And maybe they are getting better at, cr at painting that particular thing that they're painting, like the style, the, the technique is getting better, but the motif doesn't change, the subject matter doesn't change, their expression doesn't change. And to clarify this, I don't necessarily believe there's anything wrong with that. I used to think very strongly about that, that there's nothing wrong with that. But if I'm going to grow personally as an artist, I can't think that way. There's nothing in my brain that says I'm just going to keep making 
skulls over and over and over again because I want to make the best skull I possibly can. There's nothing in my head that says, yeah, that's a good idea. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying it's not for me. And now we bring it back to the musty old towel where you look at the middle part as having this need to expand and the edges, which are tight and bound, not expanding, not growing. And look at that as a comparison, say, between myself and one of these creatively conservative individuals who just do the thing that they're always doing and not expanding. They're bound. They're bound by that ridge, that that binding that holds them to their thing, and they can't grow, they can't expand, they can't ever get any larger with their work because they are bound to this idea that this is the thing I got to do, and I'm going to do it like this for ever. Myself, I still have boundaries. I still have those edges that are holding me together, which is probably good because if I didn't have those edges, I would just end up as being frayed strands on the ground of some dirty old bathroom. There's a visual. I need some constraint, but I do appreciate the opportunity to expand and grow. And even if I do get frayed a little bit here and there, a little hole or a little thing, you know, falling apart here and there, that's okay because it's part of the expression. The way I look at it is like a pair of old jeans. You can have a really great pair of jeans. They fit you awesome for a really long time. But then at some point, they get a hole in the knee. And at first, you're like, God, there's a hole in the knee. And then that hole gets a little bit bigger. And then you start to be okay with it and gets comfortable and starts to get frayed and starts to get interesting. There's this moment where you're trying to balance. Okay, well, is it is it too far gone? Am I too frayed? Can I keep wearing these? And maybe you keep doing that. And then you realize that the fashion trend has come back around and now everybody's wearing frayed pants all the time and they buy them like that on purpose, but you got yours for real. And that trend will go away eventually too. And maybe those jeans will go away at some point, or maybe you'll do what some people do and go to a professional jean shop where they remake them. They they put them back together. They they sew them up and they, they put on patches and make them interesting so that you can have this nice, comfortable pair of jeans that still has this fray, that still has this essence of... of uh, depletion, this essence of decay, of patina to them that's going to make them interesting over time. And people are going to say, wow, look at those are great jeans. But meanwhile, you've got another pair of jeans that you wear because they're getting comfortable too. And maybe they're starting to fray and they're starting to expand. And they're trying. Anyway, I, you get what I'm saying. Be like an old pair of jeans. That's probably a better visual than the musty old towel anyway. I was watching this video on YouTube recently that Chantel Martin was interviewing James Jean. And if you're not familiar with James Jean, he is an artist based here out of Los Angeles. He does uh, surrealist, postmodern type work. And I've been a fan of his for a long time and seen his progression grow, has seen him change a lot over time. And it's been inspiring to watch because I think that he really gets this idea of constantly pushing himself. His jeans are still a little bit tighter and maybe they don't have quite the fray or maybe he is one of those types that they started to fray but then he went and got them fixed so that they would stay the way they were for a long time because he has kind of fit into a, a bit of a rhythm with his work it's still looking good it's still growing but I think he's kind of found his rhythm and I think about him versus somebody like Luke Chu who I talked about numerous times maybe here other places when Luke Chu first came out I was really stoked on what he was doing. His motif was interesting. His humor in the work was interesting. And it hit. And a lot of people made him really popular really fast. And then Luke Chu didn't change. And Luke Chu just kept doing the same old thing. And he's still doing the same old thing. Still doing the same exact motif that he was when I first saw him back in 2003, 2004. He has not changed in that 15, 13, 14 years that I've seen him, not even a little bit. Yes, his technique has gotten better. Yes, his skill is better. Yes, his figures are better. The fine touch to his work has improved. You see, it's my feeling that we can grow as an artist with this, with these paintbrushes and these tools. We can grow and get better at these as much as we want. And there's nothing wrong with that. You wanna get better at the painting? Be my guest, get down with your bad self. But I think that there's also this aspect that a lot of artists probably forget about, and that's what happens here. Where are we growing here in our mind? Where are we growing here in our hearts as artists? How are we growing internally and improving internally to make our work better, to make it more interesting, to find the next thing that's going to make us even more appealing to our future fans? Are we holding on to the old thing we did 
because we're too afraid that our old fans will not understand the new work. So if we go off on the deep end and do something completely radical, will our old fan fans completely abandon us and leave us? Not likely, but I think that that's a fear that a lot of people have. I'm just guessing at that, but I'm got a good, strong feeling that that's probably true for a lot of people who stay within that conservatively creative work. Anyway, so this is an opinion. This is my point of view. This is my perspective. You may have a different perspective. You may have a different point of view, and I'm open to that, and I'm open to the discussion. In fact, I hope you do discuss what you feel about this, because I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying I know what's right for me. Maybe there's a possibility that it could also be right for you. You just haven't given yourself the opportunity to find that. But that's on you. All right, question of the day. Today's question of the day comes from Caden, and Caden asks, what do you put in your artist's portfolio? That's a great question, Caden, and I'm glad you asked. In response, I would turn around and ask you, well, what kind of work do you want to be doing? Because the kind of work and the kind of environment that you want to work in is going to dictate what kind of portfolio you put together. For instance, if you were taking your work to a gallerist to let them see your stuff, then I would definitely take a lot of your most contemporary work, the stuff you are doing today. You might also want to include two, three, no more than four pieces of previous work so that they can also see your progression. But I would have a lion's share of work be the stuff that you've done most recently. If you don't have enough work in the last year, 18 months to pull together an entire portfolio, then definitely put as much as you can and then fill with the rest. But start your portfolio with number one, the most intriguing piece, and then work through your strongest work up front and then move to also other strong pieces that are less representational of the stuff that you're doing now, but just good work that you did in the past. I've never actually done the whole gallerist set, so I don't know exactly what the standard is as far as amount, but I was a graphic designer for many years, and when I would take my graphic design portfolio, I would never have more than, say, 15 to 20 pieces in that portfolio. More than that, and it's overkill. If you are looking for more professional aspect, meaning like you're trying to get some sort of uh, illustration work or you're trying to get in as an in-house artist for something, then you definitely want to put together a portfolio that feels like the kind of work of the place that you want to go work at. Let's say you wanted to work at... I don't know, Disney Studios. You want work that's going to be more emblematic of Disney up front. So if it's Marvel, if it's Star Wars, if it's, you know, cartoony Disney characters, all of that up front. If you want to work at EA Sports, if you want to work at uh, Sony, if you want to work at one of the other places, then you need to look at what kind of work are they doing now and how does my work fit in there and put that stuff that fits best up front. I think that Instagram and wherever else you might post that stuff would be even more advantageous. Having more than 20 pieces is definitely positive. People want to see that you're constantly upgrading. They also, they also, and this is actually a sidebar to that, some of these places are going to have an opinion about how big your social media account is. If you have a huge social media following and you go to a gallery, well, they're probably going to be really keen to putting your work up on the wall because they're thinking, well, this guy could really help promote. I'm getting off on a tangent. So yeah, just, you know, do what I said in the beginning and a little bit in the middle and then just, yeah, keep posting. All right, artist of the day. Okay, today's artist of the day is Carol Park. It's C-A-R-Y-L-P-A-R-K, based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. I don't really know Carol. I mean, we, we kind of like a couple likes here and there shared on our Instagram accounts. And yeah, she's amazing. Anyway, I really like Carol's work. In fact, I it's it got this kind of um, funky, abstract, here, look, you'll see right there. This is her most recent update, but uh, yeah, they're, they're kind of quirky, amoebic, very uh, biological almost in nature, and they just have some interesting shapes, and I like that they're very organic in nature, and uh, the color palette really uh, hits hits home for me. This one is great. Uh, something about that color, the between the browns and the blues and the grays and the oranges, it just... It just really speaks to me. This is so nice that looking at it right now in this scope, I'm, I'm thinking about buying a piece because some of this stuff is just amazing. One of the things I like that she shares in a couple of places is she shares where she gets her color palette from. So 
Here's a figurative piece that she did. I'll see if I can get that in the frame there for those on the video. It's a woman's head, and she took it from this photo of an interior where it has like nice colors, grays, monotones, but with some browns in it there. And she took that and created a piece with it. And I think that's kind of cool that she does that. And she, she hasn't done it a lot recently, but a lot of her pieces have that, and I think that's a great idea. Anyway, go check out Carol's work. You can find her on Instagram again, Carol Park, C-A-R-Y-L-P-A-R-K. She doesn't have a link in her thing, but you can email her, but go check her out on Instagram and tell her that I sent you. Tell her I said hi. She's also only got about 259 followers at this current moment, so she could use a boost, so go follow her and tell her, uh, yeah, see. It's great work, Carol. All right, folks, that's going to do it. I'm going to wrap this up. But before I go, I just realized that one of the things that I didn't do with the previous conversation about expanding and growing and you know being tightened up, I didn't give you any kind of hints as to how do you go about this? How do you expand? How do you grow? How do you break out of these binds that you may have in your work? There's a lot of different ways to actually approach this. In fact, the same aspect of maybe going and doing something completely uncreative, like something that's just automatic, and let the subconscious mind start to percolate ideas. When you get a crazy idea, whatever that crazy idea might be, act on it. Just be like, whatever, I don't care what happens, I'm just going to do it. To illustrate that, not in this video, but in the next video or one of the next videos, you're going to see me do exactly that with this canvas behind me. I'm going to extract this crazy idea in my head and see if I can turn it into something on this canvas here. I might mess it up, but I don't care. We're just going to go at it, see what happens next. All right, party people, I am out of here. But if you did enjoy this conversation, if you did like this video, do me a favor, go into whichever platform you happen to be at and do the due diligence. Like it up, share it, subscribe to your particular channel, my channel in your space whether it's iTunes or YouTube, SoundCloud or wherever. Go find that thing and then go like that thing and then go share that thing. <laughs> Help a brother out, all right? That's it. Remember, be good today, be better tomorrow. See ya. Find her on Instagram again, Carol Park, C-A-Y, no, C-A-R-Y-L-P-A-R-K. So for the easy, so for the easy, be good today, be better tomorrow. See ya. Jeez. That's a good one. I like that.